All right, so a tradition that we have at Centrowitz Running Camp is our conversation with Matthew Centrowitz, a 2016 1500 meter gold medalist. One th good thing that's come out of the pandemic is we've gotten a lot better at video conferencing, so the technical issues we normally have when we're at Fort Smith Abbey, hopefully we don't have today. Um, and we're grateful that Matthew has the time to join us today, so thanks for joining us, Matthew. Um, Absolutely. We got some questions for campers, but first we just wanted to check in, see how you're doing, how things are going with your training. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a crazy year, um, as I'm sure it has been for everyone else. Um, but training's been going pretty well right now. Uh, a lot of my teammates are actually racing uh, tonight, and they've done some races in the last couple of weeks. Um, unfortunately, I had a, a minor setback um, right at the end of our altitude camp. So just kind of, you know, with nothing really, no big races this year, we just kind of been playing it safe and, and not really rushing me back um, for a lot of these, like, inter-squad meets. So yeah, just kind of uh, getting some good training runs in with the team and and uh, slowly building back up into uh, into getting into some hard workouts again. But yeah, it's been it's been obviously quite quite the season um, with uh, the Olympic postponement, you know, back in uh, early spring, late late winter. So um, since then, it's just kind of all about you know maybe being able to do things in your training or. Um, being able to like tackle some like imbalances and weaknesses that like maybe you don't really have the time to do during the season, like with the Olympics coming up or that you might wait for the off season to do. And um, yeah, it's kind of a lot of experimental stuff this, this year. I feel like it's a lot of people and a lot of um, training stuff. So you brought up the Olympics and actually one of our adult campers, Charlotte, who you know Charlotte well. Um, yeah, of course. She actually asked, um, what was your like initial feelings when you found out that the Olympics were being canceled? Oh man, um, it, it was a bunch of emotions for sure. Um, obviously, some sadness knowing that like you'd have to wait another year to. For me, especially like being thirty years old, um, you know, I'm only going to be younger uh, today than I am uh, ever rest of my life. So obviously, sooner the better for me. But at the end of the day, you know, you can only control what you can control, and uh, I definitely took away some positive stuff. Um, I didn't have like the greatest like fall buildup. Um, I, I missed a couple months um, back in December, November. So one positive I was kind of looking at it was that, you know, there's a chance that next year I could have a much better build up going into the Olympic year. Um, and I, yeah, I kind of had like minor setback anyways during that time. So for me, it was just like, it was, it was a huge inconsistent um, year so far. So there was a little bit of relief, um, not just because of like where I was with my fitness, but there was just so much like so many rumors floating around during that time. Like, is it going to happen? Is it not? And like, you know, we weren't like, races were getting like put off or like getting canceled. And so for me, I was like, man, like, <clears throat> sorry. I was like really like excited about opening up my season. Like, I think it was like early April, like at Stanford and then that got canceled. And I was just like, well, I don't want to be rusty going into Olympic trials. And so like, you know, not having all these are going into whatever the Olympics or whatever was we were able to run. Um, so it was also like a sense of relief, like when they finally postpone it and like just because they kept putting it off. And I think we all as athletes were just like, look, we don't have access to like gyms, training facilities, resources that like we normally would have access to. So we obviously like felt like it shouldn't have happened for like everyone's safety as well. But they, for whatever reason, obviously, like with, I mean, I know what, you know, not for whatever reason, obviously there's a lot of money, billions of dollars put into Olympics and they really wanted to like make it work. But I think obviously logistically and um, the right answer was to kind of postpone it. So. So you actually kind of alluded to this, this idea that actually this, this 12 month postponement in a way you'd let you focus on some things that you wouldn't normally focus on or maybe wait till after the Olympics. So what, um, how do you approach the, that, that focus of like, working on something different like what is some of the what are what is an example of something you might work on like that yes yeah, so for me i've actually done a really really poor job um the last few years with like i mean during this this zoom call already i've already kind of mentioned a handful of little setbacks i've had and so i've i've been like very inconsistent with like like prehab rehab and just like flexibility exercises before and after runs and not saying that that would have, you know, eliminated all those, um, those setbacks or a little, you know, um, injuries, but certainly it could have minimized maybe a few of those. So for me, it was just like being able to like kind of build this routine that like allowed me to like work on some flexibility stuff that I know I'm lacking right now. Like, 
anytime I get like a good stretch from like Tommy to Hilly or um, like a, a physio or strength and conditioning coach, it's like, man, you're like super tight. Like it's, it's like always that comment. And like, I feel it. And I'm just like, you know, especially being 30, it's like, I got to be able to, I need to be doing more of that than I was when I was 25, you know? And I felt like I kind of hadn't been on my A game with that stuff. So for me, it was just like starting like with incorporating some of those exercises before and after my runs. Um, and not saying I couldn't have done it had the Olympics been going on, but I felt like it was like a nice, like clean slate being like, okay, like, let's take a step back here and be like, you know, what, what's going on and like, what can I do better of? And uh, knowing that we have, you know, right now we have probably like, what, 12, 13 months to Olympics. It's like, it doesn't have to be like something that I have to like shotgun and like get it all in and, and, you know, start being aggressive with it. It's something that I can like kind of slowly build and, and I don't have to rush into it. Um, whereas most, most of the time it's like, you know, once the season's over and then you finish your off season, it's like, or you're like a little break or whatever, you're like looking at like nine months until like the, the next big world championships, or Olympic trials. So um, this is like the first time I feel like in most of our careers where we have like a good solid year to like really get things figured out and, uh, and sorted. So you said your routine and this is personally for me, but also for the athletes I coach and I know a lot of the campers, how long you say you do like a little routine before and after, how long does that take? Just time wise. So uh, the first few weeks, it takes a while because you're if you're new to it and you're like you know you're struggling with like for me like my my balance is off. So like you know if I have to do ten like reps of like um, uh, these hip flexors, you know they have like these sliders I do now and it really just kind of like opens up like hip flexors and the hips and everything like that. My balance is off and I like find myself like stumbling and like it takes me quite a bit to do like ten reps of those, you know. And now like I've, now that I've gotten to get a better feel for the exercise and my balance is a lot better. It's, you know, it's probably the time is probably cut in half. So for me, it's like, you know, it, it, and you don't want to make it personally, I, you don't want to make something that's like, like super lengthy or strenuous or else you'll find yourself like kind of like dreading it or like, you know, find yourself more times than none, like not doing it because you're like tired from a run or like tired from a workout. So I would just keep it short and simple. Like, and obviously it varies for, for every athlete on like what they need to work on specifically. But for me, my hamstrings and adductors and, and hips were like kind of like the big issue. So a lot of my like four to like six exercises that I do before and after my, my daily runs, um, just kind of focus in that area. And it probably takes to answer your question, probably about like five minutes now I'm down to like, you know, five, seven minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, but for sure it took closer to like 15 minutes the first few times I started doing it. But I think it's, I think that's important for like the campers and like for my athletes to also like just to hear it doesn't take 30 minutes. It's a five to seven minute routine once you get it down that can help do what you need to do to help loosen up and strengthen and everything like that. Exactly. That's yeah. I think, I think, yeah. I think if you, if you, you know, if you, at the end of the day, like you can make as many exercises as you want. You could be there doing it for hours. You know what I mean? You can always find exercises that you know you might have or like certain areas of your body that you've neglected or uh, you know new exercises online or from like a handful of different people but that doesn't mean that's exactly what you need or that might seem like overwhelming especially for someone like me who's like knows that I've been struggling and lacking this and you know I don't want to go to zero to 100 real quick so for me like right now a nice like seven minute routine is perfect and you know, as I continue to like bring that down a little bit and get a little bit more efficient with it, then it's fine to add like another exercise or, or like tinker with it. Like as I go along, like, okay, yeah, like great. My, my hamstrings are loose now and they're feeling great, but now my calves are a little bit like tighter. And then, you know, maybe I add an exercise with, with my calves and maybe I take one away from my hamstring, but so it's always changing. You know what I mean? Like you just have to adapt as, as you kind of go along with your, um, with, I guess your career. Um, Kind of going into training, and you actually mentioned a little bit with, with the team. Uh, this is from uh, Gino, one of our campers from Gardner. He was asking if you prefer training alone or with a group, or kind of like, I guess, even getting into like the benefits of training with the team, um, or even, and I, this actually came up with another camper, and I forget which one it was. It was like, do you ever just, if you're with the team, do you ever want to just go for a run by yourself? Um, Absolutely. No, that's a great question. And I actually don't have uh, an answer for you because I would say like I enjoy both of them equally. Um, for me, I trained a lot in high school by myself because, um, a lot of the guys in the team weren't doing like the mileage I was doing and, and, and whatever. Um, so when I got to college, I was like, wow, this is great. Like I have like everyone on the team 
um, can do the same amount of runs. And obviously a lot of them were better than me, even in, in races and workouts. So I always had someone pushing me. And I found after my freshman year that I went from like training completely by myself to like not having one run by myself. And I made a conscious effort the next year to at least incorporate one, if not two runs a week, just on my own. And it was so I could just go my pace. Like, and, and my pace could be slower than what the guys were doing or it could be faster. It wasn't like, like they were like slowing me down or it wasn't like they were like pushing me too hard. It was just like, I can dictate it, you know? And a lot of times when you have like a bunch of guys, um, like especially with the Bowerman Track Club right now where we have like a dozen guys and a dozen girls, all like very similar like level of fitness, like you're not going to feel great every day, but certainly one of those 12 guys are going to be feeling good. So it's nice like on certain workouts to have people drag you along. And then on the flip side though, sometimes it's good to just listen to your body and um, kind of go to your speed. And so for me, I like the, the solo runs to kind of clear my head and, and do some thinking like about like the upcoming race or the previous workout or like what I can improve on with like some of these exercises, like I mentioned. And then there's other runs where, you know what, I'm like, you know, I really am dreading this run and it'd be great to have some guys that, you know, get me out the door. It's maybe the weather is crappy or like, I'm just not feeling it. So I think it's just like, listen to your body or see how you feel on the, on the specific day. But um, I like them both equally. So you brought up the weather and this was um, the team from Guilford actually combined their questions to make it a little easier. <laughs> Guilford asked about how the weather affects your training and um, you know, things like, like right now where it's, it's, brutal out in the east with like heat and humidity um or even like in the cold in the winter um how does that affect what you do um and actually coach reinhardt from northampton asked if um you did if you do anything specifically to prepare for a meet in like an olympics like a meet in rio or in, in tokyo do you do anything with the weather that way so that's really two questions there but yeah yeah, yeah. so um the saying in the track and field world is uh humidity is poor man's altitude so, and actually, like, I, I don't, I never did the research, never really looked into the research, but apparently um, they have research that backs that you do get the same benefit um, when you train in uh, humidity as you do in, um, at altitude. So um, that's something that when I lived on the East Coast and the humidity was absolutely brutal on the, on the sum, um, during the summers, was like something that I definitely played in the back of my head, like my teammates like the socal kids or like i don't know like wherever other kids in the, in the country were training they're not like you know they're not gonna be as tough as me because they don't have to deal with this type of humidity you know what i mean so i always made it as like a, as a big advantage um being in, being at uh being in 100 percent humidity back in maryland and in dc during the summers but um but yeah i mean what i would have to do a lot of times is wake up early you know what i mean and and, uh, and just kind of like get out the door so um, the quality of my run didn't like go down quite as much if I like was to do it at like 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. And, you know, you're just absolutely dreading every single minute and, you know, you can't last longer than like 30 minutes when the day was supposed to be like an hour run, you know? So, um, yeah, I just kind of like, it just made me get up in the morning a little bit earlier and, uh, you know, force me to take a nap later in the day. But, um, but I, one thing that, that was kind of what, the humidity piece, but one thing that I really liked about Oregon with the crappy weather, like the, the rain that we get and the wet, damp weather during the winters and the gloomiest, what I liked about it was it allowed us to peak at the right times during the year. And, you know, when, when you see like, I don't know, guys that have access to indoor tracks um, at different colleges, or when you see like teams like Arizona, um, Florida, like the Southern states that have like unbelievably like beautiful winters where it's like, 60 70 degrees and sunny and no wind and you see them absolutely tearing it up during the indoor season or like early spring and you're like well yeah like you know if they were supposed to run 27 seconds for a 200 and you go out there and it's a beautiful day it's hard not to run quicker you know whereas in Oregon it's like you know maybe like we can't run faster than 28 because the weather just doesn't permit us to do it and that allows us to like maybe not have such a great indoor season, which in the grand scheme of things isn't the most important season of the year, but allows us to like really start to kind of get rolling and slowly build to like this unbelievably like great peak during the June, July months, you know? So I've always looked at it as a blessing, like, and rain is rain. I mean, you know, snow is a lot worse, winds a lot worse. And um, I understand that there's, there's some 
um, athletes that will go to college um, in during these states that have this kind of uh, climate or like they're training like that during during high school. But you're just going to have to adjust training and understand that like maybe that day you know you're supposed to run mile repeats in five minutes, but because of the weather, five ten is going to be the equivalent of five minutes. And you just you just have to understand that mentally. Like you just can't like get upset with the weather so much that it causes you to think that you're like in worse shape than than you really are because you weren't able to hit the times you just have to be able to kind of roll with the punches and um yeah you kind of have to uh just play those kind of play that tune in your head about like nobody's training in this like sub-zero temperature nobody's training this humidity like but me like you know like this is going to make me tougher this is going to make me you know, when June comes and the weather is going to be great, like this is going to make me think about those times that I was training in, you know, much tougher climate and was able to get the work in, you know, make me better for it. So, kind of, because I, I did ask you too that month together, do you do anything specific? Like when you know you're going to like Brazil or to Japan? Do you- I, I have in the past, yeah, I definitely. With the, with the Oregon project, we, um, we bought sauna suits in 2013 and we were in Park City, which is already hot in June, July. And we put those sauna suits on because we had the world championships in Moscow and they were talking about it being really, really hot. And the funny thing was it actually wasn't hot at all, but <laughs> yeah, we, we traded these sauna suits and it was miserable, but um, being a miler, I like, and being from the East coast, I love heat. So right. like when we go to like world championships in like in Beijing and in Moscow or like down the Olympics in Rio and people were just kind of hyping up how hot it's going to be or like whatever, like for me, I was like, always like bring it on. You know what I mean? Like, it's Des Moines is you know is pretty humid and, and super hot during the months of June and July anyways that like I felt like that prepared us really well for or Sacramento in 2017 was one of the definitely one of the hotter meets I've ever competed at and I've always done I've always responded pretty well at it so I never really let like that type of weather affect me um so much when you uh go out and train I know sometimes you have like this is what the coach says you need to do but do you always like do you time, like, do you use a running watch and, like, time everything? Or is there sometimes you just basically throw the watch away and go for a run? I know what my dad would say. Um, yeah, growing up, um, you know, it's uh, no secret, anyone that knows my dad, that he absolutely hates the watch. And he's the only one that can carry the watch at the track. And if you get caught even looking at a split, you're going to get reamed. So I really like that he forced me not to wear a watch early on in my career because it really taught me how to learn pace. Um, and I don't think I would be as good of a, of a pacer or like really kind of get that feeling or have that feeling, um, as an athlete now, if I didn't have that foundation, like growing up in high school and a little bit in college, taking off the watch, but you know, now as a professional athlete and knowing pace, I I do wear a watch and, um, you know, we train in a, in a forest pretty much at Nike. So it's kind of hard for a coach to kind of give you a split at like the other end of the track. And then there's a lot of groups going on. So, and you might be doing different workouts. Um, you know, like the team might be doing mile repeats and you might be doing 1200s. And so like, it's always good to like kind of get your own split, but I'm not a, I don't just, I don't really like, you know, stare at every single hundred meter split that I, I, you know, might go through in a workout. And usually towards the end of the workout, when, it might be like all you got. I'll dr- I'll drop the watch and just kind of go off a of feel because a lot of times you surprise yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're I make it up if you're trying to run a two minute um, eight hundred at the end of a workout and you go through in like fifty, let's say you go through really fast like in fifty six, you probably start he- you might start doubting yourself like oh shoot I went out too quick like I'm gonna die or like you have those thoughts like that you know or like vice versa if you go out in sixty two you might be thinking like oh shoot like I feel really crappy and that I thought that was gonna be a sixty but it was really sixty two. So you start playing all these mind games where like you never know what your limits could be. You know what I mean? If you drop the watch and just go out off a of field and more times than none, I surprise myself usually on that last rep when I drop the watch and run usually quicker than, than the coach asked me to, or what I felt like that, that interval was. So um, yeah, I think, I think it's good for young athletes to like not look at the watch so much and go off a of field because I think they kind of like, be too attached to the split or, or to the time they're supposed to run. Um, and it's also a really good way to like kind of understand pace. And I think a lot of athletes, I even see a lot of professional athletes that I've been teammates with that are great athletes who have made, you know, Olympic finals and whatever, and they don't even know what a 60 feels like. And I think that's ridiculous. You know, you should come in within a second of that, like as a professional athlete, when you're making Olympic finals. <laughs> um, what about a training log? Do you keep one? 
so <laughs> that's been something that I've been really pissed about uh, the last few years. I kept a training log for the first through high school, through college, and for the first like five, six years of my professional career. And then I got lazy the last few years. And I've noticed, I think it's like something like kind of a correlation in, in high school and college where like when you have good grades, you like when you're doing well academically, you usually do well athletically. And I feel the same way with, with training logs. When I keep a detailed training log and I'm, and I'm looking back at it and I'm like very um, in tuned with it is usually when my running's going really well. And um, I yeah, I've been kind of beating myself up. I, I've bought, I bought like, I don't even know, three or four different like training log books. And I've started and just like got lazy or forgot to like fill them out. And uh, I, this, this Zoom call is definitely holding me accountable. I'm going to make sure I get back to it. So. Well, as a coach, I'll say I have a hard time getting my runners to do it. So I was just trying to yeah. see what. Um, no, I was, no. And that's what kills me is that in high school, like, before I would even do my homework, I would go to my training log and write to the splits down. And I never needed one of those watches that like could save splits. I didn't have to write it down. I could tell you, like I could do like 20 by a quarter mm -hmm. and I could tell you exactly each interval that I, I hit my splits for. I, I had this like great memory up in my head and I would write it down in my training log as soon as I got home and I would study it, figure out like what I averaged, like what does that mean? Like what I could run for a mile or two mile or whatever compare it to like the last time I did 20 by a quarter, I'm making it for example. Right. Um, and then like the next day in school, I'd be writing them down again, like on my like notebook paper, like, you know, just calculating them and like breaking them down. I mean, I was like an absolute like statistician when it came to like this kind of stuff. And, uh, and because I wrote it down, I could tell you from, from years um, in the past of what workouts I did, like just because like I wrote it down and I would study it and I always remembered it. So like, if I went to college and my coach was like, Oh yeah. Like, do you remember like what you did to prepare for like that race? And I'd be like, yeah, about a week before that race, I did it so-and-so workout. And I remember this workout because of blah, blah, blah. And like, I don't know. I was just so in like in tune and like ingrained in, into like my training logs that it actually bothers me that the last three years, like since the Olympics, I would say since 2016, I've, I've done a really poor job of like keeping a, a log, but I would, I would suggest every young athlete for sure like right now, like it doesn't have to be a fancy notebook or like, you know, sometimes I see some that have like inspirational quotes every day and that's great. Like if, you know, if you find one of those and that's what, but it doesn't have to be that way. It could just be a simple piece of paper and a pen and just start day one today of what you did. And it doesn't have to be, again, it doesn't have to include the weather and how you felt like that. That's great. Like I would suggest you do it like putting as much information as you could possibly do. Like you know, like it was hot, like put little notes there, like, you know, how you felt, like what you need to improve on. Like, I remember my logs had like, felt like shit, went to bed super late last night. And I would like underline it a few times, like need to do better job on sleep. And then like, I did a better job on sleep. You know what I mean? Like I, and like going back, I can remember like, wait, like I'm looking at this workout. Like, why did I hit the splits? And I'm like, oh yeah, here's a note on there. Like I'm making up like ate a huge Sunday you know, before the workout or whatever, you know what I right. mean? But obviously be detailed as much as possible, but you don't feel the need to like include every single thing. I, I can't imagine you staying up late. That doesn't seem like something you would do. I don't know. Me? <laughs> I know. It was rare. It was rare. Yeah. It was like once in a blue moon. Um, so a bunch of questions. I mean, I know, and we've talked about this too, but like this idea of motivation is so difficult since March, really, um, for everybody, professional athletes, high school athletes, and even um, someone like me who's just out there running. Uh, so, you know, Charlotte, again, had asked this question, like, what, have you struggled at all with your motivation since, you know, basically the pandemic began um, with everything being pushed out for so long and really not even having like the regular meets to go to, let alone the Olympics? Absolutely. I mean, as professional athletes, you know, <laughs> we really have one huge meet circled on all of our um, goals or you know, uh, to do list, whatever you want to call it. And it's the Olympics. And so when those got postponed, it's, you definitely take a step back and, and realize like, wow, I don't have like another year, like until that happens. And we don't even know if that's going to even happen at all. And so you definitely found your, I mean, at least I found myself training for a few weeks, not training for a few weeks, wondering like, what, what is there to do? You know, like there certainly aren't any like big races coming up on the horizon that we knew about at the time. 
um, to even like showcase like what kind of fitness you're in. Um, and so, yeah, I think a lot of us, um, me especially, like took like probably like a solid week, week and a half of just not running and ate like crap, you know, bought some candy, stayed up late, you know, played video games, whatever outlet that like made you cope with, um, you know, not having like, uh, you know, a goal that we all had for four years, you know, and um, come to realization that one, it's not going to happen for another year or two that it might not happen at all. So yeah, I mean, as professional athletes, like, um, I think we all go through periods of time and, and this is not even just even if the Olympics weren't postponed. I mean, we go through periods of time, it's, you know, it's a long year, 365 days of being consistent and, and training hard, like, you're going to run into a lot of days where you're just feeling unmotivated and like, you're going to want to take off and uh, and sometimes you do or like stay you know stay up late or like you know whatever whatever makes you you know get out of the habit that of of training hard and going to bed early and eating well like we all like you know want to break out of it at some point and uh and the postponement olympics was certainly um a reason for all of us to kind of like get out of that get out of that training mode and so um yeah i don't i don't care if you're uh you're a professional athlete or, or um, a walk on a D2 school. Like, I think we all go through the same things of um, feeling unmotivated at times. And um, I think it's normal. What, what would you recommend to like say a high school student who's left with the right now, the uncertainty about maybe their fall season or, you know, coming off of not having a spring season, like how might they keep their motivation going to get out there each day and do. Some yeah. I mean, well, one, I think the, I think you have to realize that there are going to be plenty of days that you are going to feel motivated. And I think realizing that and understanding that first is the first step, because when that happens, you're at least prepared for it. And then you can figure and then you can figure out yourself like, OK, when that day comes, this is a good day. Like I spoke earlier on seeking out a teammate of yours mm -hmm. to go for a run, you know, like whether it's like, you know, whether you're training really well for like the next month and all of a sudden next month you realize a new news comes out about your, your cross country season not happening. And then you're back to like feeling unmotivated again. So un understanding that like, Hey, like, even though right now on paper, you know, you might be training towards something like whether it's a cross country season or indoor season, whatever, understanding that like, Hey, like there might be a time in the, in the near future where like things get continue to get pushed back and be prepared for that. And, and have like maybe a list of things like when it, when it happens, like, I'm not going to go to bed late just because like it got pushed back. Um, understand that like, yeah, like this cross country season might not happen, but there will be a season in the future, whether it's going to be this next school year or the following year. And you're only really digging yourself more in a hole by like, you know, doing these, these, these things. And for me it would be like staying up late and, and eating junk, junk food or whatever it is. Like I'm only like these little setbacks I'm having, I'm only making these injuries worse. or I'm only making that like, return to like fitness level like that much harder because there there is going to be a day um hopefully sooner than later but we don't know right now but there's going to be a day where like races resume and, and we get back i mean you already seen some races right now with uh, my team for instance like they're time trialing right now but um you know it will work itself out and we'll get to a point where we're back to to normal racing and um you don't want to find yourself like in such a hole that it's going to take another year to get back to the to the level that you were at before this pandemic hit so my advice is like yeah it's okay to be unmotivated it's okay to take you know whatever those days that you needed but um it's it's going to happen with these races and and you know you're going to zoom training with your team again and um believe me as a as an athlete who's been in the sport now for so long um it's not worth it those those days of taking off or doing all the wrong things um i wish i could take back i never i never walked away being like man i'm glad i did that you know it's usually kind of man i wish i maybe didn't have two donuts but one you know what i mean during that day <laughs> i wish i didn't have any because it does it didn't make me feel any better than um you know just kind of sticking to the same routine that you're in and, and doing the right things um changing gears a little bit actually this came out uh today that um, Jim Ryan is going to be given the Presidential Medal of Freedom, you know, the sub four minute high school miler. And, and I know that um, there's a tight community among Olympians and let alone like milers. And um, yeah. I just, I just wonder if you could talk about your relationship with him and, and uh, kind of what that means like for him to receive this honor. Um, yeah, I got this actually just hanging up in my, uh, in my fridge, uh, on top of my fridge, which is a, a signed copy of his Sports Illustrated cover. 
Uh, it says, go with God, Matt, Jim Ryan, and then I uh, put a Bible verse down there. Um, but yeah, he signed that for me like a while ago. And uh, it's just funny that like, um, after all these years of like idolizing him and, and uh, you know, back in high school, the only book I read was the Jim Ryan story, which I got as a gift. Sorry, from, um, I think from my dad. And uh, if any of you athletes haven't read that book, it's definitely a great read. Um, I thought that book did a great job of like detailing some of his training and uh, kind of, um, and it included some really cool pictures um, of him back in like high school and, and early college during his, uh, his golden years. Um, but I just kind of fell in love with, with Jim Ryan's work ethic and, and his uh, obviously his um, ability to just go out there and, and grind these world-class times at such a young age, you know what I mean? Like he was going up against world record holders um, when he was in high school and, and being fearless. And that was something like, as a high schooler reading this, like taken away from like, for me, like, man, and I'm over here just like nervous about racing other high school runners, you know? And, uh, and yeah, it just, it was just a huge inspiration for me growing up. And um, I've been wanting to, to meet him for so many years and, and uh, he sent me actually a really cool email um, the middle of the day before my Olympic final, which was really inspiring to me and a really cool thing. So when he reached out uh, recently about me being one of two guests of his to, to receive this um, amazing award honor that I, no hesitation, obviously, was extremely honored to, to be there in attendance and, and, uh, and finally a great opportunity to finally meet the, the man, the myth, the legend. So um yeah i'm really excited uh it's going to go down this friday and um we'll sure for sure take some photos my father and i with him and, and other guys like alan webb will be there so um it's kind of a cool like american miling reunion um yeah. with with guys like jim ryan who is obviously older than than alan and i but then alan who came before me and and you know really brought um american middle and distance running you know back to kind of where it was um decades prior and uh and then and then me um who hopefully kind of carried that torch a little bit a little bit longer so um yeah I'm really excited about it and uh yeah just honored that he asked me and Alan Webb to to be there with him yeah it's, it's pretty awesome um you mentioned the mile actually there's a Guilford team actually had another question like are you thinking about maybe running some more 5k's after what you did last uh or in on the Nike campus or absolutely what, not <laughs> so you want nothing to do with it <laughs> absolutely not that was the hardest race I can remember in the last several years I mean I remember like feeling like I was going to throw up for hours after that race like I couldn't even like I couldn't even celebrate and um enjoy that 5k PR because I was just in such a terrible um, well not, um, I just, I just, yeah, my, my stomach was just absolutely wrecked. Uh, my legs were shot for weeks. Um, no, I think, I think that 5k was something that, that was kind of reinforced for years for me that I was, you know, more of a, dis, more of a strength, 1500, more of a strength miler than, than 800. But, um, and Jerry's training is, is structured for the 5k. Like, I mean, I feel like our 10K guys do 5K stuff. I feel like our 1500 guys do 5K stuff. I feel like our Steve players do 5K stuff. And then he sprinkles whatever you need for your primary event, you know, in there. But most of the stuff that we do is, is for sure built for the 5K. And I, and then, you know, I think it was like five or six all-time. Jerry's coach, five or six to the all-time 5K um, Americans on the, on the top 10 list. So, I mean, you know, he's just, and then not, don't even get me started on the women, obviously, what he's, what he's done with them. And so, yeah, um, I, I don't plan, we, we spoke about it. I don't plan on kind of moving up to the 5K right now until I feel like I'm really maxed out in the 1500. And, and I definitely feel like I still have some um, things I want to accomplish in the, in the mile in the 15. And uh, I still think I have some um, really good years ahead of me still in that event. So, um, you know, the 1500 is obviously the signature event. It's such a, it's such a, um, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a glorified event that everyone like talks about, you know, you do the mile running when you're in high school or middle school, whatever it is. And so it will be like, I'll have to be ready to know that I can medal in the 5k and know that I probably won't have that chance in the 15 anymore to really step up. And right now I don't feel like I can medal in the five. I, I, you know, those guys are running 13 flat and coming back and doing it again a few days later. And I just don't feel like I have the strength for that yet. I can run maybe one really good one, but um yeah 
I, I need a few more Jerry years under my belt before I could step up to that five. So <laughs> as of right now, uh, it's still, still a miler. Yeah, I, I know that's where your heart was anyway, but I, it, was oh my a, God. it was a good question. After here, after great question. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I like right after that race, I wanted no part of 5K anymore. <laughs> I mean, I, I was happy that I, I ran, you know, a great time and was able to, you know, have that moment with my teammates. But obviously, it's it's such a it's such a hard event that um, I, I feel like I need a little bit more consistency, like with training and, and really figure out like kind of my body, which I feel like you know just the inconsistency I've had under Jerry and, and still able to do that it bodes well for the future. But um, yeah, I need to, I need to string a lot of consecutive um, months together to feel comfortable stepping up. So you've, you've alluded to like kind of your goals going forward. We know, I mean, obviously the Olympics next year in Tokyo and, you know, you said you've got some stuff you want to accomplish. Have you allowed yourself to think about what you want to do after your running career? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, every, every, I would say every time I get hurt, every time I get digged <laughs> up, I'm like, all right, uh, what, what do I want to do? You know, um, I, I do know one thing I want to do is just kind of have my hand in, in a, many different pots. Like I don't want to be like maybe just tied down to one specific career, one specific job. Um, I definitely want to be interacting with people. Um, I, like to have at least one of those hands in in the still in the track and field world pot whether it's like commentating coaching um being an ambassador for for nike or a company you know whatever it is um i i definitely have a passion for track and it's given me so much um with my life that i'd love to like i know it's a cliche but like give back to it a little bit um but i don't really know yet what what arena or to what capacity i guess um in what capacity but um but yeah so i just kind of have a lot of things going i have a lot of things that i definitely the back of my head that like i'm interested in and um hopefully i have a few more years to like figure that out and it's not next year but we'll see so but yeah yeah um, um okay so anyway i've taken a lot of your time and we appreciate the time you've given us so yeah yeah um, this was great and no, no technical issues, which is something that we always struggled with. So that's awesome. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you for joining us for camp, our virtual camp this year. So thank you, Matthew. Yeah, of course. And uh, to all the campers, I hope you guys are enjoying your summer, enjoying this um, unusual time, uncertain time, but taking advantage of it with um, all the kind of freedom that comes with um, this uncertainty, like with training and with racing and with linking up with, um, different people to train with as well. So, um, we, I don't know if we'll ever have a, a time like this again in our lives. And so I, I definitely suggest instead of, you know, viewing it as a negative, um, taking some positives away from it and taking advantage of it. So that's my, my only advice to you guys and, and hope to brighter days in the future. And hopefully we can all get together next year, um, back in uh, Newport, Rhode Island and, uh, be able to have this conversation in person. So all right. All, right. all the Thank best. You so much.